show the book there um, <laughs> that I will be uh, focusing on, and it is uh, Edward Glissant's uh, Poetics of Relation, Poétique de la Relation. And in uh, Edward Glissant's uh, Poetics of Relation, he aims to give a, a theoretical model of the landscape of the Caribbean, uh, the inexhaustible sphere, as he says, uh, the experience of the French Caribbean. He says, it's, it's, it's the experience of the abyss. He says, quote, straight from the belly of the slave ship into the violet belly of the ocean depths, they went. But this memory of the abyss, of the slave ship, he says, served as an alluvium for a transformation, which in the end became knowledge, and a freeing knowledge of relation within the whole. Now, Glissant, a, a Martinique theorist writing this in the late 1980s, rests alongside uh, traditions in literary and post-colonial theory and takes up the, the preoccupation with communication and estrangement and alienation. He says, the exile readily admits that he suffers most from the impossibility of communication in his language. And we see this kind of echoing ideas that we've already seen before in post-colonial tradition regarding communication, the ability of the exile, the subaltern to speak, as it were. Um, so, Glissant uh, designates the term opacity to refer to the position of the French Caribbean subject. Opacity for Glissant connotes that kind of veiled, shielded aspect that we would expect when we hear this term. But it, it isn't, as he says, enclosure within an impenetrable autarky, but subsistence within an irreducible singularity. The opacity of the Martinique subject is not this hermetically sealed, forbidden system of enclosure. Rather, approaching the opaque means to resist looking through the surface of being. He says, for the time being, perhaps give up this old obsession with what lies at the bottom of natures. Or in other words, in other words behind this veil of opacity. He says, in doing so, opacity can, quote, coexist and weave fabrics, and it, quote, weaves no boundaries. Now, this openness of opacity fosters relation <coughs> with a capital R, which is, to quote my uh, professor, Birgit Kaiser, the cultural multiplicity of our globalizing world. And this cultural multiplicity, this open fabric of rela relation, exists in experiencing the opacity of Caribbean poetry. Poetic relation for Glissant is the means for a free, boundless, cultural multiplicity. So what grants this opacity? What, how does it, as he says, coexist and remain open and weave no boundaries? If something is, is unclear or it's not transparent, how can any relation, how can we expect any relation with the subject? Well, for Glissant, the right to opacity gives the right, quote, the right to differences. And he says, we clamor for the right to opacity for everyone. Because so far, Glissant says, if we examine the process of understanding people and the ideas from the perspective of Western thought, we discover that its basis is the requirement for transparency. Glissant goes on to sort of gesture in what we, what we kind of hear in Western thought, something that goes like this. In order to understand and thus accept you, I have to measure your solidity with the ideal scale, providing me with grounds to make comparisons and perhaps judgments. But Glissant wants to undermine this transparency, this ideal scale. He wants to undermine the comfortable grounds on which we feel comfortable making comparisons. In other words, he wants us to retain opacity and retain, as he says, the right to differences. But where exactly do these differences lie? Well, for Glissant, part of this obsession with, lie, with what lies at the bottom of nature, as he says, connects to an obsession with the mythology of filiation. Now, filiation is it's officially the process of being a child or a descendant from a specified ancestry, right? And in the Western perspective, Glissant says, legitimacy rigorously ensues from describing in reverse the trajectory of the community from its present to the act of creation. That is to say that a nation or individual's cultural legitimacy is thought to derive <coughs> from a mythologized, traceable mythogenesis. And, quote, uh, Western mythologies conceive of the individual only insofar as he is a participant in the community, or in other words, quote, a link in the chain 
of filiation. Now this is a pretty familiar notion. We can recognize, for example, that in Christian theology uh, conceives of its main figures as descendants from Abraham. And we also notice that there's sort of a, a, a history of nations utilizing filiation as a way to justify sort of a nationalist agendas and so on. Um, now, for Bisson, he says creating this mythology of filiation, though, for a community isn't, it isn't generalizable. It isn't the sort of universally valid in creating a normative conception of identity. In the French Caribbean, their history isn't this sort of ecumenical origin of a mythical community. Because remember, as I said at the beginning, they have a memory of looking into the abyss. Because this is a past of displacement. This is a past of violence. It's a past of slavery. So in history, this mythologized version of history, no longer creates a conception of being traced to origins and creation myths. And the, the Caribbean experience doesn't assume the normativity of filiation. But, the spectrality of their violent past did offer, as Glissant said, an alluvium for a metamorphosis, a transformation into a freeing knowledge of relation within the whole, or a relation identity. Relation identity doesn't rely on ideal scales for uh, comparison, as he said, but as we see, as we see in the Western perspective, the relation identity isn't as, quote, linked to the creation of the world, but rather relation identity is linked to, quote, the to the conscious and contradictory experience of contacts among cultures. This cultural multiplicity sees being existing within a totality, or as, quote, to quote Lorna Burns, a synthesis of cultural features. And it moreover moves freely with a kind of errantry, as Glissant says, a, a, a transformative development into this free knowledge of relation, in which, as Betsy Wing says, the translator says, she says, where every voice can be heard and all can be said. Now, for Glissant, relation identity, as opposed to the root identity of Western thought, produces their opacity. Because, as he says, it, and, and he says, it resists the hidden violence of filiation. Now, this idea of a hidden violence of filiation is crucial. Because remember that filiation gives the Western world the ability to measure, to make comparisons. And in doing so, it makes identity comprehensible. But we want the right to differences. We want the right to opacity. And the right to opacity, therefore, requires incomprehensibility. And to say that there's a hidden violence affiliation suggests that there would be a violence of comprehension. Now, some of you hear echoes of this already uh, from Jacques Derrida. Remember, on his lectures on hospitality, he says, hospitality undoes, should undo, the grip, the seizure, the force of the violence of the taking as comprehending. And the etymology of the term comprehension, as Betsy Wing notes in the, in the translator's notes, it comes from the Latin comprehendere, literally meaning to seize. Uh, we know this in other languages, too. Uh, in Dutch, we have begrijpen, literally means to grip something. Okay? But we want to undo this seizure. We want the right to opacity and the right to differences. So if it, if it isn't comprehension, then what does this communication look like? Well, this is, it's approaching the term that we saw contrast to comprehension. He says it's something like donere, which, which Betsy Wing has translate, translates as a, a sort of giving on and with. Uh, this phrase has the benefit of sort of connoting uh, a generosity, a giving. It allows you, the listener, to participate in a kind of dialogic relation on and with the subject. And it won't be communication where you extract meaning by committing the violence of comprehension, by forging a sort of transparency. Because it's not asking you to make easy generalizations, to overcome opacity. For Glissant, there is something freeing about avoiding what he calls, quote, the comfortable trap of generalizations. So I take it the most perhaps interesting discussion uh, that we can, we can move toward in this regard is to see how it applies to Caribbean poetics or Caribbean literature. That is Glissant's focus, after all. He says, quote, we cry our cry of poetry, our boats are open, and we sail them for everyone. But what does this giving on and with that avoids the comfortable trap of generalization look like with the poetics of relation? 
Well, we'll see a really interesting chapter in, in Glissant's book, Poetics of Relation, where he analyzes Western textual traditions, most of which find their comfortable home in the myths of filiation. One analysis he, one analysis he makes is with Shakespeare's The Tempest. Some of you might already see where this is going. Uh, he says that Shakespeare conceived of legitimacy and power of conquest as ultimately working together. And ultimately, we expect right, from Shakespeare to, care, to always carry out the destiny of the rightful beneficiary or heir to the throne, either through sacrifice or extermination, that returns, quote, the claimants of the English throne to legitimacy and power. And we'll remember that right from the start, Prospero is the legitimate Duke of Milan. He's the beneficiary of legitimacy. And what gives him this legitimacy? Well, it's the sacred mythology of filiation. And we'll remember that at the end of the Tempest, Prospero is restored to his dukedom, his position of power, formerly usurped, said Glissant, making this the historic, historical heroic tale of legitimacy, since Prospero is, after all, a, quote, link in the chain of filiation. Well, let's do what uh, someone else, uh, what uh, Ami Césaire, who is a, was a contemporary of Glissant, did in uh, Un Tempest, which was a retelling of, of the Tempest, and imagine the same story, but set it in the Caribbean. And now imagine an ending that doesn't turn out in the historic Shakespearean way, but rather a story where Prospero is not able to control Caliban, where he can't wield his authority over the territory, quote, the elements and the colonized subject, where he isn't able to live a comfortable life of transparency, and where, again, he isn't restored to his dukedom. Well, Prospero's experience is a little bit different. Because we'll remember that in Shakespeare's version, the very ending, we'll remember, we'll remember he gets up, he stands in front of the audience in a very sort of dignified nature, right? He asks us to not let him dwell on this bare island any longer and to release him from these bonds with our good hands, which is our applause, right? And that's the end. All is good, his legitimacy is restored, his power is restored, and the curtain comes down. Well, in Césaire's version, we see a little bit of a different Prospero. He no longer has this quality of dignity anymore. Here are the last lines in Un Tibet. Ah, but for some time now we seem to be overrun with possums, peccaries, wild boar, all the unpleasant animals, but mainly possums, with those eyes and the vile grin they have. It's as though the jungle was laying siege to the cave, but I shall stand firm. I shall not let my work perish. I shall protect civilization. Well, Caliban, old fellow, it's just us here, us here on this island, only me, you, you, me, me, you. What in the hell is he up to, Caliban? Now this, do this doesn't look like the same Prospero we saw in Shakespeare, does it? This looks like someone who's disoriented after his not getting the legitimacy that was promised to him once. In other words, he seems like someone who's lost in the opacity of the Caribbean. The opacity of a land where the myth of filiation is not the basis for authority, where the expectation of being and identity are not present in this region, even though he's supposed to be the link in the chain of filiation. Because this region doesn't accept and doesn't embrace as it were, the Western concepts of legitimacy and identity generated through filiation. And therefore, as Glissant says, if legitimacy is ruptured, the chain of filiation is no longer meaningful, and the commun community, and in this case, the community of the English claimants to the throne, wanders the world no longer able to lay claim to any primordial necessity. And indeed, if Prospero expects identity to be legitimized through filiation, and expects the capacity to control the region, to control, as Glissant said, all of the elements, then he commits the violence of comprehension. And similarly, if we read Untempet, expecting a transparent, heroic, historical, Shakespearean tale, then we as well commit the violence of comprehension, and we're not thereby, thereby granting the right to opacity. Now, for Glissant, the inviting this giving on and with, instantiated in opacity, means to participate in, again, relation with a capital R, that leaves no boundaries. Now, for we saw this concept, which will be familiar to many of you, connects to <coughs> Pierre Deleuze and Philip Guattari's concept of the rhizome. We'll remember that the rhizome ceaselessly establishes connections, quote, quote, ceaselessly establishes connections between semiotic chains, organizations of power, and, quote, has no beginning or end. It is always in the middle between things, interbeing, intermezzo. That's from A Thousand Plateaus, of course. Or, as Glissant says, is uh, a network spreading either in the ground or in the air with no predatory rootstock taking over permanently. Our connection to the Caribbean, our reading of Caribbean literature, is a free knowledge of relation. It exists as a rhizomatic network. 
Our continual participation in this poetics, rela uh, uh, poetics of relation produces what Glissant calls the chaos moan. Now, the aesthetics of the chaos moan embraces all of the elements and forms of expression of this totality within us. It is totality's act, quote, it is totality's act and its fluidity, totality's reflection and agent in motion. That is to say, producing this aesthetics, this experience of the chaos moan, allows the fluidity of expression and totality to exist un unobstructed. And that means not imposing totalitarian boundaries, as Glissant says. So with each reading, each moment of experiencing this totality, uh, we're, we, we allow this freeing knowledge of cultural multiplicity. And that's what our reading of poetic relation creates, a world of totalities and multiplicities, freely existing, non-obstructed, opaque, that are given on and with and not controlled by a predatory rootstock. Now, Derek Atridge recently, uh, some of you may know, had a book called The Singularity of Literature. And he says that reading an inventive work is to respect its otherness, to respond to its singularity, to avoid reducing it to the familiar and the utilitarian, utilitarian while attempting to comprehend it by relating it to these. You see, there's already a connection here. And it is thus our responsibility, says Atridge, as readers to do so. In other words, the opaque features of a text are to be embraced as such, treated as completely unfamiliar and outside of the reader's, quote, ingrained modes of understanding. Moreover, these ingrained modes of understanding restrict what Atridge refers to as the singular act of approaching a new text. So we see here a kind of compatibility with Atridge's reading ethic, as he says, and Glissant's chaos mode. For to exist within the act event or to live within the chaos mode asks us, asks us to, to overcome generalizations, our desire to make things transparent and universal. We have to allow opacity to exist freely and without boundaries. So we owe it to the Caribbean, to the poetry of the French Caribbean, to embrace the opaque, or as Derrida says, to be inconceivable and incomprehensible. As Glissant says, we cry our cry of poetry, and indeed, this is a cry that is meant to be heard. Now, um, I'm going to gesture in the, in the way that a lot of papers earlier today were talking about Franz Fanon it seems to be a, a favorite theme today. Um, we'll recall an intriguing moment in the history of Martinique thought and self-conception where Franz Fanon wrote The Wretched of the Earth, a text de designed, of course, to analyze the condition of the colonial subject and a movement toward liberation. Well, Jean-Paul Sartre writes the preface to the original version, if some of you might remember this. He says he's addressing the European audience. And he says, this, this text isn't for you. He says, this isn't about you. Sure, you can read it. You get your own sense for self-alienation, if you'd like, which is probably a pretty unsettling thing to say, or some unsettling thing to hear. Well, for Brissot, who similarly advocates a poetic, uh, a poetic liberation, a freedom from totalitarian boundaries, says here basically that these poetics are not for us. They're not attempting to satisfy the comfort of transparency for the Western reader, to satisfy the reader who looks for a confirmation of human identity and being. You're invited to read, to listen, and to participate in the chaos moan. But the violence of comprehension restricts this freedom. Instead, move freely with Glissant, with Deleuze, and Guattari through a network of freeing relation of cultural multiplicity in which every voice can be heard and all can be said. Thank you very much.